trying to figure out how to view this camera. Um, anyways, I'm uh, here actually working on some new um, some new rod handles. I got these uh, new threaded mandrels that um, my buddy Jake and I uh, are working on. So um, hopefully we'll be bringing these to uh, all the guys that are doing custom rods. I don't know if this is better to do this like, nope, rotate device. I'm going to keep you guys like this. Give me two seconds to uh, get a better setting for the, the phone here and I'll, I'll get with all you. Okay, I think that should be a little bit better. All right, so what's up, guys? Haven't haven't seen you here in some time. I'm uh, I've been doing a lot of um, working on fishing rods this summer. Um, really busy uh, restocking the shop with all the the summer stuff, and um, been doing some trout fishing here and there. Haven't really been able to do much for videos, but um, hoping to get some guys together to uh, to bring you guys some new content here pretty soon. But Anyways, I want to say what's up. I'm down here in my basement, you know, plugging away on some rods. Uh, anyways, I wanted to show you guys um, for the rod building community um, some new mandrels we have. And the reason why these are different than your standard mandrel is with a standard mandrel, there's no threading on it. So you pretty much have to um, stack all the cork or wood or whatever you're turning down onto the mandrel and then use a clamp to clamp it up. I'll kind of show you guys what those look like real quick. So this is a standard mandrel. Um, this is what the cork handles look like before I'm going to turn them down. Um, so I pretty much got to drill a hole to whatever size uh, the mandrel is. This one here is a half inch, so it's a pretty tedious process. And uh, we'll end up getting a pretty nice result after it's all said and done. You know, they typically typically look like this when they're all finished. I know you guys have seen my rods before, but yeah, they're uh, they're pretty good looking, especially after you get some finish on them or a light bit of hand oil or some oil from your skin. So after you get this all, uh, all on this mandrel, you got to use a clamp, which typically, which typically looks like this here. So it's a pretty pretty uh, simple clamp there just two um, pieces of wood and two threaded rods and you clamp it together and you're ready to turn it down after you wait 24 hours for them to dry but um, you know I haven't really uh, used these new mandrels yet I'm pretty excited to but uh, just by um, lining a couple handles up uh, kind of the benefit to these like I said you don't need to use a clamp but um, secondly uh, Secondly, um, it has this this little tapered end here um, that's thinner than the threading, and that's so when you put it in the chuck, um, it doesn't have to grip onto the threads, and you don't got to make it super duper tight. So, uh, really, really helpful. And you know, these have a um, counter bore in the end, uh, so you can put them on your live center of your lathe. So, um, pretty, pretty handy. Uh, but the reason I like these um, as well is if you um, if you drilled your holes and the cork is a little sometimes you got to really force the cork down the mandrel and you got to put a lot of wax on the mandrel so uh, if you um, if you happen to get a little glue on it uh, the wax allows you to be able to pull the cork grip off the mandrel a little bit more easily. Um, so the cork rings are pretty much tight. I'm trying to get this back a little bit further here for you guys. So the um, so the cork rings are pretty tight. So with this, because you have um, a thinner diameter here, you can pretty much. It's a lot easier to slide the cork down. So um, and the mandrel, the threading actually helps almost ream the cork out a little bit for you. So. How I've been doing this is I've been stacking them. I guess that would be about two inches. I've been stacking it about two inches high. And then I'll slide it down. This is uh, a cork handle. It's got natural cork, some green burl in there. 
Um, I did a checkerboard that I'm going to have to line up here. Uh, I'm really not doing this video to show off these mantles as much as I'm uh, just uh, coming on here to say hello and um, see how you guys have been. Thank you all for your support, as always. But, uh, yeah, I've been seeing a lot of guys doing the mini pin fishing, which I think is so cool. It's really amazing to be at the, the hub of a sport like this. And, um, you know, I get a lot of guys that ask me about what casts are called and and me and my buddy matt were actually talking about this yesterday and uh you know the casts we do aren't you know the cast that i would call a wallace cast it isn't actually a traditional wallace cast like you would see in england it's uh it's really like we've developed we've modified these casts and they really don't have a name yet so um you know, it's pretty cool because I've been, you know, kind of naming them just based off what I think they should be called. And they're really sticking. And it's uh, it's just neat to be at, you know, at the hub of the fishing that I love. And it's uh, it's starting to become a whole nother sport. You know, I've been sending these to um, all over. I got some customers in Germany. Um, thank you to uh, the two gentlemen named Marcus, and actually one is named Marcus and one is named Marco, and uh, really awesome to send some reels across the other side of the world. Um, a lot of guys in Canada and British Columbia, so uh, I'm just super blessed. And then I got, you know, I got my customers that order a reel every month. You know, it's just, it's incredible how amazing um, everybody is and how I'm able to able to do all this uh do all this stuff and bring you guys these products and um i'm pretty close uh with the new shop here i'm just um working on getting uh, a commercial um mortgage and it seems like it's not going to be an issue with the whole circumstance um with uh down payment and the rates and everything it seems like that's going to be a go and i have a lot of my uh a lot of my vendors are going to give me promotional stuff to put around the shop and I had um, I had a friend of mine from Wapsi offer to donate a bunch of fly tying stuff that I'll have there for you guys to use when you come and visit. So if you want to tie some flies, there'll be some some tools and stuff available for you. So really, uh, I mean, it's just amazing how awesome people are out there and how shitty some people are. But luckily, I surround myself with some awesome people and you know keep on keeping on and so this is what this one's gonna look like i have to line up these checkerboards here but you know with the checkerboards they look really cool and classy when you get them all said and done so and like i said instead of clamping this like you would normally have to in between the two wood clamps you'd have to how i normally do is i you know i kind of spread these apart and i i paint the glue on um, and kind of move them together and then I kind of turn them to find the sweet spot so they lock in um, And after that then you put it on the uh, You put it on the clamp and you get it clamped up overnight it, that the glue I use is called rod bond um, I've been using it for 20 years now. I got I mean, I've tried some other glue here and there But that stuff is really by far the best stuff in the industry. So yeah, like I said, it's called uh, What's up Jeremy? How you doing buddy? Um, but that stuff's really the best out there. Um, so another thing too, I'm hoping, you know, all these guys, uh, the addicted fishing guys and a few other guys that do podcasts, they have a, um, a room that they, uh, that, it, that they have for doing all their podcasts. And I'm definitely going to have something like that at the shop, you know, set it up with some cool banners and decals. So it's better looking than my messy basement here, but I do love it down here. Um, don't take many people down here. It's kind of my little getaway and um, I can really relax and focus on making some awesome rods. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to have a cool room that I'm going to be able to do these podcasts. I got to find a team of guys locally here in Buffalo that can set up the camera and do all that. Um, you know, that's the whole thing I'm missing with uh, my channel and everything. I could really have a kick-ass channel if I could just, um, if I could wear a GoPro and then give somebody the GoPro to make a cool video, that would be so much easier. But I'm just so busy. I 
and I don't have a computer where I could edit the videos and all that stuff. But, uh, but yeah, so this is a handle. I got to still glue it, but that kind of shows you guys um, this new mandrel. And um, I'll be sending people to this video to kind of show them this new product that we're going to have. Um, I've really been getting into selling uh, rod building components lately. I've been making a lot of reel seats for people. And, of course, I have all the colored hardware to go along with the reels. So you get rods that are just absolutely incredibly gorgeous when you put the reel with the rod that, and they're all matching. It just, it looks just, it looks like a million dollars. It really does. But, um, not sure what, uh, everybody's been up to. I hope you guys have been getting out and doing some fishing. Uh, the, the walleye fishing hasn't really set up great here in Lake Erie. Um, we've kind of had wacky temperatures and it's still, the lake's still fairly cold. Um, it's been kind of weird, you know, like today was 82 degrees, but you know, you've had a lot of seventies, you know, and, and at nighttime it's been getting in the forties and fifties. So it's been, it's been awesome for the trout fishing. It really has. And, uh, you know, the, the, the brown trout fishing up in the mountain streams, um, up in Pennsylvania has been has been doing really well and uh, Lake Ontario the salmon fishing um, That's been uh, It's definitely been a big fish year and the fish have been more up on the North Shore from what I've heard I haven't made it out on Lake Ontario and done any trolling yet um, This year, but uh, I'm sure I'll do it once or twice before the season ends But I don't know. Did you guys see that 42 pounder that was caught in Coburg, Ontario, um, pretty incredible, a 42 pound fish. Uh, that that's just for the Great Lakes fish. That's a giant. Um, and I was talking to uh, one of my buddies up in Ontario, Gabriel, um, a cool younger guy, um, who bought a center pin from me this past uh, this past spring. Um, you know, he had told me that uh, salmon salmon will typically gain a pound a week in the summer which would make that fish 60 pounds you know when it would run in august or september um i don't know if that exact number is is true for the great lakes uh he said that he had heard it from um a charter boat captain in british columbia which i absolutely believe that kings will put on a pound a week in the ocean up in uh british columbia but I would say if the bait source is good and the temps are right, um, a salmon could absolutely put on a pound a, a pound a week here in the Great Lakes. Um, and it's kind of the same story in Lake Michigan, uh, from what I've heard. Um, it's it's mostly all um, wild fish at this point in Lake Michigan. Uh, Michigan stopped stocking kings, so they're re really relying heavily on their wild natural spawning populations and. It is absolutely incredible that um, that the fish could spawn so well in Michigan that they don't need to stock salmon anymore, and that just shows you, you know, if if you pick the the right fish for the right area, they can flourish just so incredibly. Uh, you, you know, they've they've had. Um, They've had their own strain of fish in Michigan, I don't know, for probably 100 years at this point. The first uh, steelhead were stocked in the Great Lakes in like the 1870s. And Ernest Hemingway wrote about how the, the rivers used to be black with um, 10 to 15 pound rainbow trout. So uh, it's, it's pretty incredible that um, there's been steelhead that long and they've kind of established to become their own strain uh in lake michigan that will that will run up in michigan um another cool thing is uh the other day um i was flipping through facebook um it was actually on june 5th and because of what happened i can't really um forget but uh a friend of mine sean west and his his um wife or girlfriend buffy they they usually fish uh the ontario tributaries in new york and I saw them catch a, uh, a Chinook salmon that I wish I could show a picture to you guys right now, but it was a fairly, I mean, it wasn't a black fish, but it was, you know, a green, you know, a green bronze salmon that they caught in, on June 5th in the river that looked like it was mature enough to start spawning within, within a month. 
and uh, it's cool. It's it's not a common thing, but you got to figure when you're constantly breeding fish, some of those um, upper river bright genetics or those spring chinook genetics will pop up. So I'm pretty sure you know what that fish was was a spring chinook that just had popped off in the genetics. It could have been one of the fish that made their way down from Michigan, possibly through the systems. I mean, I hear of that kind of stuff quite a bit. Um, and you would be surprised at how much the fish actually travel the Great Lakes. I, um, I don't know of any studies that uh, I could refer to, but um, we often catch Atlantic salmon in the upper Niagara from um, Lake Huron, and we do get some Lake Huron run fish in the Erie tributary. So um, I know that happens quite a bit. Uh, and we do get um, Huron Chinooks in the Erie tributaries as well. So that is a, uh, a pretty cool deal. Um, so I don't actually know where that salmon came from, but uh, June 5th to catch a king, it was a female. Um, he ended up giving it away, but I would have loved to see what was in the fish's stomach. I mean, it probably... I'm sure there was eggs. Like I said, I don't know how mature they were, but I would have loved to see it. Um, you know, stuff like that is just so intriguing to me. I just love the history of the stocking in the Great Lakes and whatnot. Um, if you guys stayed right with me here, I'm going to grab some glue and mix it all up and start gluing these handles, and I'll keep chatting with y'all. If you have any, I think you can ask questions or comments and we'll pop up. And if you guys want to talk about anything with fishing or rod building or reels, uh, we could do that. I know it's like four in the morning and I'm the only whack job that doesn't sleep and just stays up and builds rods all night. But, um, you know, if you're awake and you're watching, you know, chime in. So this is a product that I typically like to use. Um, I've been using it forever. It's called Rod Bond. Uh, it's, a, it's made by Trondac um, in Monroe, Washington. Really incredible stuff. There isn't a, a better wood, a better cork handle glue that I've used. Um, I've tried gluing up some. Um, I started messing with birch bark, and you kind of get uh, kind of get some thin rings and thick rings. And this is a hard a horrible example because it's not turned down so you can't see it but I glued this up with a wood glue um, just to see how that's gonna work but I'm gonna try these birch bark rings uh, that I've used for um, for these handles I'm gonna use a rod bond on them uh, the other cool thing with these with these clamps too is um, when you have the birch bark uh, it typically will like bend like a potato chip like after you harvest the birch bark and you make all the rings which is an unbelievable huge project but um i did it this uh this past spring um got some beautiful birch bark uh it's from a yellow birch it seems like what most rod builders use they buy the sheets of birch bark and it's black birch but um i use the yellow birch and um I got some really thick stuff, so it should be really cool because I can mix the thicker rings with the thinner rings and uh, get some really, really cool results here. Um, but like I was saying, the mandrels are also cool um, being threaded because uh, you could slowly tighten it down. So when you stack all the birch bark on there and if it's got a little bend, you could slowly tighten it down and let that bend kind of... Um, kind of like slowly flatten out so it doesn't crack. If you crank it down too much, you'll snap the birch bark. What's up, Oscar? How you doing, buddy? What's up, Brandon? So anyways, with this glue, you're supposed to have equal parts, and um, I typically will mix, uh, you know, just kind of eye it up, mix like a good glob in each. What's up, Taylor? Taylor's my buddy. He's been spending tons of money with me. 
I'm good, Oscar. Just plugging away. Nice to hear from you. So, guys, Taylor's from Wisconsin or Minnesota. Where are you from, Taylor? Which one? I should know. I've sent I've sent the guy like four reels here. Him and my buddy Jason. Um, they've been a huge supporters this uh, this past spring. Minnesota, he's from. So uh, they got some really interesting fishing up there. Um, some cool brook trout and brown trout for the mini pins. He was just saying um, he fishes Wisconsin mostly, which, you know, if you guys don't know about Wisconsin, it's like the best brown trout fishing in the Great Lakes. The harbor fishing is absolutely incredible. Um, I love some of the harbors in Wisconsin. They have some really great rivers. I'm not into really naming rivers very often, but... Um, but if you look them up, there's some great rivers in Wisconsin. Um, the harbor fishing is actually a little bit more unique, um, in my opinion, versus what else is out there. I mean, the, the harbors, uh, you can, right now, you could be fishing the harbors. If you catch the wind right, um, you'll get some Chinooks that come in pretty tight along the shoreline. Um, and... Uh, some of them, I don't know if there's still some warm water discha uh, discharges, but um, I fished some back in the day, and uh, you wouldn't believe the um, the fish that would come in. I mean, I used to take uh, my little mini center pin back, like in the early 2000s, to some of these some of these rivers in, or some of these harbors in Wisconsin, and I would uh, I would just I would tie these big white articulated streamers. Or actually, there were jigs, but they looked like a streamer, and I would just twitch them in the harbor like really fast, and uh, I would catch these just monster chrome chinooks on the on the little center pin. And um, there's some submerged rocks, and I was kind of paying for paying for not using a uh, bigger reel because I couldn't catch up with the fish and keep them tight. So by the time I got tight to some of the chinooks. Uh, they had me wrapped um, around some submerged, uh, some submerged um, rocks down there. But uh, yeah, um, my buddy Jordan, uh, Jordan Wheeler, he's uh, one of my um, buddies from way back. Uh, he was a young kid who invited me up there to go fishing, and uh, he ended up catching like a, like a twenty-two pound skamania off the. Um, off one of the break walls up in Wisconsin on like a live alwive and uh, it's pretty cool how different it is you go up to those um, harbors and the the piers up in um, Wisconsin and up in Michigan and you see the guys they, they catch a lot of the um, they catch a lot of the uh, alwives they just run gold hooks and they they live line them on the bottom um, with like a fish finder rig with a sliding um, the sliding sinker that uh, the line can travel through the the sinker without the fish feeling it and um, they'll, they'll actually set up the bottles all along all along the pier and it's uh, it's pretty interesting a lot of the guys over here in Lake Ontario they do that for snagging salmon you'll go there at night and they have all these tight lines out there and they're just waiting for these fish to swim into them so they could snag them in the face, hopefully in the face. A lot of times it's in the ass, and um, they drive from all over the world, all over the country to snag salmon off the break walls. It's incredible to me. I gotta grab a paper towel, hang on guys. I should come to New York and fish for Browns and Steelhead, Brandon? Or are you talking to Taylor or one of those guys? Because I do live in New York, and I fish for Browns and Steelhead quite a bit. I don't love, I don't love uh, Lake Run Browns. I always called them European trash fish, and then, uh, then I started fishing more for the inland, the wild brown trout, you know, in the Delaware River. Um, that's one of the more popular wild fisheries, um, in New York. Uh, it's up towards Hancock, New York. 
Um, but there's the East Branch and the West Branch of the Delaware River. Uh, and it's mostly like a fly fishing deal. Um, and, and the guys hate the center pinning there, but it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely incredible if you guys have a chance to look it up. And um, one cool fact on the Delaware is uh, there, there was um, a train that was bringing steelhead to the east coast from Washington, and the train broke down, and uh, the conductor of the train actually took five-gallon buckets and took all of the um, steelhead, the steelhead smolts that he had on the train and dumped them into the, uh, dumped them into the Delaware River. So they don't have migratory steelhead per se, but they have steelhead genetics in the Delaware, which is really cool. And then those things fight like you wouldn't, like you wouldn't believe. I mean, they're absolutely super duper incredible, super fun to catch. Uh, really enjoy it, but the browns are really what what I like to catch when I fish the Delaware. I mean, it's they're all wild fish. You very rarely catch anything under 16 inches because I swear all the big ones eat them. Um, but uh, you got thunder going on over there, bro. Oscar, where are you from? But, uh, yeah, we've had some pretty crazy weather. The other day, um, two days ago, I had a bucket sitting outside. So Oscar's from Illinois. Yeah, I had a bucket sitting outside. And uh, I had this, it was like probably a three-gallon bucket. And within two hours, I had that three-gallon bucket almost filled up over the brim. Um, so, you know, a lot of those smaller, a lot of those smaller rivers, uh actually that that you would fish um during the summer you'd swear there was no fish in it and you have to wait for high water events like that to hit it just right um you know these are creeks that you'd walk down and you you know you'd fish them for you could fish them for days and not see a fish and when the water gets up those browns come out from under the undercut banks and the log jams and they just absolutely go go crazy it's uh it's a pretty um, pretty unique thing, and I fish some of these smaller brook trout rivers, and uh, the smaller brook trout rivers, like those fish, will actually live under rocks and like under waterfalls that that where the water has spilled over and made a cut out underneath a slate, and it's almost impossible to find these fish. Um, but if you throw little nymphs along the the sides of the rocks, um, the brook trout will come out and grab them. But um, I saw Oscar talking about uh, scams in Indiana. Um, I heard that was going pretty good. There was a couple hot days there that kind of shut the fish down, but I know the fishing was really amazing. I had a couple of my customers that are actually heading out um, on Monday. They're going to be down there. Uh, my buddy Tyler and another younger kid from the shop. They had a video of the um, the spillway, and they said that there was, it was like a 10 second clip, and about 10 fish jumped over the waterfall in that 10 second clip. So I got my glue all mixed up, ready to go here. I'm gonna start applying it to one of these handles. Um, I've got smarter over the years, and I've realized that um, I've realized that uh, it's not worth it to try to mix up enough glue for multiple handles because it will start curing on me. So I actually will do a couple mixtures of this. Um, yeah, Brandon, scams are really incredible. It's a shame we don't have better water for them. I know that uh, there was a guy who was fishing for bass at Oak Orchard the other day, and he actually caught a scam that was stocked into either the Little Salmon River or the Salmon River. It had it had one of the pectoral fins was clipped, but uh, I, that was one of the, I mean, it's pretty cool. I've never actually gone to Oak Orchard in the summer and targeted those, but I would say if you did, you would probably get into some. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the scams, I mean, the scams, if you, I don't want to blow up any fisheries, you know, other than Oak Orchard or Burt Dam, but... You know, if you spend some time 
um, researching what's going on in uh, some of the upper Great Lake states, you can definitely find some good scam fishing that isn't in the ditches of Indiana. Um, it is great and it is challenging. It gets old kind of quick for me. But, uh, I mean, if you could land some of those big, high teen size fish in those ditches, it's absolutely incredible. Holy crap. I had a fish one time. Um, it was probably my first or second trip to Indiana. I hooked a scam. It jumped out on the other side of the bank. Um, it rolled around on the opposite side of the bank and went back into the river and all my, f my float, my rig was all wrapped up in the brush across the river or across the, the creek or ditch or whatever you want to call it. And then the fish fell back in the river, took a run and snapped me off. And I mean, what an incredible, I mean, I've never had a fish do that jump out of the, <laughs> jump out of the river on the opposite side of the bank. I've had them run me into log jams and stuff, but to actually go airborne and get on the opposite bank and drop back in the river, it's crazy. But uh, And those things can seriously ruin some gear. Uh, you know, I see more guys, they take their normal steer, steelhead gear there and, you know, they run the normal four-piece rods, which I suggest a four-piece over a two-piece because you could break a four-piece into two pieces and if you ever want to break it down further, you can. Um, and if you break a section, you're only breaking a small section of the rod. You're not breaking half the rod or something like that. And the chance of you breaking the, the handle section is pretty rare on a four-piece. And that's where usually all your money is. But um, uh, a lot of times when you're fishing for these scams and you hook them, they're so violent and they, they're so acrobatic that they actually can like separate um the sections of the rods and just recently i sold this beautiful carbon fiber net to a friend of mine there and you know after about he said he caught about 30 or 40 scams this season that he put in the net and a scam went right through the bottom of one of those um vinyl ghost nets and it's just it, it's it's incredible. It really is. Um, but those things, uh, I mean, Michigan and Indiana is so demanding on gear because you got log jams and logs, which you're constantly hooking. You got trees all over that you're smacking the rod into and, and, um, you're, you're hooking fish that are just kicking your ass and snagging wood is like the worst thing to snag because there's like a little bit of play and when you hook a piece of wood you're not gonna like it you're not gonna wear your line off and be able to snap your fluorocarbon so what's happening is you're stretching your main line out over and over and over again and if you're if you're jerking the rod you know up to try to get the snag out like this what ends up happening is, you know, you just start to separate those pieces of the rod. So make sure after you land a scam or you get a snag, you know, check check your check your rod. You know, make sure the sections are tight, and um, you know, just just think about too how much you're beating up your main line every time you do that. And one thing this last year, salmon fishing up in uh, Michigan, um, that I realized, especially with the new chromium line. Um, what's up, Duke? How you doing, bro? I was hoping you would chime in. Um, I figured you'd be up. That's my buddy Duke from Washington. Um, so, I forgot what I was saying. But yeah, so if, you, if you're snagged up and you're using a low stretch line like a chromium, um, or any line you don't want to do this to, you don't want to like point the rod at the snag and just reel because all that tension is going to eat right through all your line on your reel so if you got a good snag and you can't seem to break it real easy you got to like grab the line in front of the reel and try to back up where you're not going to cut the line through the rest of the line that's sitting on the spool i see a lot of guys they damage their line and they think the line is faulty but when you're snagged up and you're reeling 20 pounds of pressure against itself, something's got to give, especially if you don't have a good layer of backing to kind of like give it some cushion. 
Yeah, that that chromium stuff, Oscar. If you haven't tried it, it's absolutely incredible. It's it's a game it's a game changer in my opinion, for sure. Um, we're actually pretty damn lucky to have that line in my opinion. Uh, we're lucky that the the company um, it's called Hatina. Um, they were willing to work with me and take a risk on making all that line because uh, you know you can't just make one spool line. You have to make an absolute ass load of it um on the machine so i'm lucky enough that they trusted enough in me that they were willing to run a bunch of line for uh for you guys and everybody seems to really like it you know i had i had heard there was a little bit of an issue with the 16 pound high viz um i don't personally fish the high viz and i, I i've ne i never field tested the high viz so i can't tell you if that's true or not but I could tell you, everybody fishes in different conditions, and people fish differently. And I, I'm not, I'm not a guy that typically has issues with, um, with my line because the way I cast, it really comes off, the line comes off the reel, um, you know, the same way it goes on, which is, you know, it spins, it spin the 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 spool spins as the line's coming off of it. So, if you. Uh, if you cast proper and when you're retrieving, you get in the habit of kind of, you know, using your hand as a level wind, uh, you'll be in, um, you'll be in a lot better shape for the life of your line. Hey Duke, uh, have you been fishing at all, buddy? I haven't heard from you. Any, any, uh, kokanee or anything in, um, any of the rivers out there, buddy? The best line for trying pinning is absolutely the chromium, 100%. Blood run line is also also great too, but there's a lot of stretch. And if you're fishing around a lot of wood where there's a lot of snags, you're going to really be putting that stuff to the limits. Um, you're going to have to change it very often because you got to think about it. What do we change all the time? We change our leaders because that's what gets snagged and that's what gets freed as we're fighting fish. But uh, we don't really change our main line very much because it's all rigged up. It's got all of our shot on it. It's got our float on it. So we pretty much just leave our main line um, rigged up and we're changing our leader. So there's a fresh uh, leader on that's constantly going against our beat up main line. You know, after a few fish and after a few snags, the main line has really had a lot of pressure and a lot of wear and tear on it. So, you know, you do want to check it every once in a while. What I'll do is I'll just slide up, you know, 10 or 15 feet. I'll slide my shot and my float up the line and um, I'll, I'll wait till I feel like where it's, I'll wait till I'll feel it's really fresh line and I'll, I'll cut off 10 or 15 feet. And, um, and that way, you know, by doing that, you're not you're not really damaging much line. You're not going through much line, and I'll typically do that every other trip or something, or at the end of the trip. I don't change up the line very often, or I don't cut a section of the line off very often, especially if I'm trout fishing. I very rarely do it. With a trout fishing, I'm typically not really running much over a five or six pound leader, maybe a four pound leader. Let's see if I could figure out how to get some of these comments back. So I am not a high vis guy at all because I've seen it um I've seen it hurt you or or hurt people um when it comes to fishing some lower clear water and I don't want to have to add extra swivels and extra um fluorocarbon and extra connections in there. I've been fishing, you know, a low vis line with um with my float and all my shot on my main line with a swivel every once in a while if i need to get very stealthy i'll run my main line to a swivel and then i'll run a couple pound heavier fluorocarbon than what my um leader is so for example i'll typically fish 15 to 20 pound line if i'm trying to get stealthy i'll run a eight pound fluoro um, below that probably like 18 inches and I'll put all my micro shot on that and then below that I'll run a, a four or five or six pound liter 
with my hook and my bait on it. And what that allows me to do is um, I'm not really going through much leader because when I'm changing it, I'm only adding uh, um, I'm only adding about 12 inches of leader each time I change that four or five or six pound. I should probably have a rod to show this to you guys, but like I, I didn't really plan on going through all this stuff. I just wanted to uh, check in with you guys and say hello. I watch I watch a lot of these podcasts or not podcasts, I guess they're YouTube channel channels where um you know guys sit in a chair and they just sit there and shoot the shit with everybody for a little while and i really i really like watching it because i've just i really don't talk to a lot of people especially when i'm building rods because i'm trying to focus and it's oddball hours like this so i i do like watching some of those youtube channels where the guys are sitting there you know talking about random subjects um, I watched this one today. It was uh, Chael Sonnen, who was a UFC fighter from um, Oregon, and uh, he was talking about uh, what makes a good cheeseburger, and he was talking about how um, you should never serve a cheeseburger with red onion, um, and uh, he was just talking about different types of pickles and different types of buns, and I, I absolutely loved it. It was so entertaining. So um, I want to try to, you know, just sit there and, and shoot the shit with people more. Best summer fruit. Uh, mulberries is what I think the best summer fruit is because you can't really get them. Um, you can't really get them um, any other time except like in two weeks they're going to be ripe. Um, and carp love mulberries. Uh, growing up um, in New Jersey, there was a lake I used to fish. Uh, it was called Deal Lake, and there was a mulberry tree. And I never ate the mulberries. I don't know why I never did, but I used to see them staining the, the sidewalk, and I'd see them in the trees, and I would never eat them. And... Um, my partner Tony in the real business, uh, he's his dad has a mulberry tree, and oh my God, I can eat a million of those things. They're absolutely incredible. And Tony's brother John gave me a couple seedlings that um, the birds eat so many of the mulberries that they they poop the seeds everywhere, and you get little baby mulberry trees sprouting up everywhere. So he gave me a couple, and I had one live. I planted it at my daughter's house, and they're just awesome. Yeah, they are really, uh, it's really cool to see if you're, if there's a mulberry tree by a lake though, because the carp really like to sit underneath those, those trees and catfish. I mean, they're definitely fruit eating fish for sure. What's your guys' favorite fruit? I've been, I've been eating, I love, I mean, you can't beat a good nectarine, a really sweet nectarine. Holy cow. I, I had one the other day, an organic one. It was just off the charts. I like papaya too. Papaya is pretty damn good. But the the nectarine was absolutely incredible. And you can't beat a good blueberry and a good strawberry. You know, the other day I got some mangoes that were called honey mangoes and they were definitely not nearly as good as a standard mango. Like, they were, like, really sour. They were from Mexico. Uh, I I don't know. I was very disappointed in them. And, and I don't know what food store you guys shop at, but over by me we have a, a locally owned grocery store called Wegmans that started in uh, Rochester. Um, and it's absolutely incredible. I mean, Wegmans is by far, I mean, we got Whole Foods here. Um, I think there's, uh, there's this shitty food store called Tops. I mean, it's shitty now. Back in the day, it used to be really incredible, though. I guess it was kind of, uh, it just can't keep up with Wegmans. Wegmans really, they carry so much incredible stuff. I mean, they get fruits that you've never seen, um, there's these oranges called sumo oranges. They're just off the charts good. I've definitely never had a red mango. I don't know. Uh, I don't know when those are in season or where you get them. But anytime I see like an oddball fruit, I always try to buy them. Cause I mean, 
how cool is it that we live in a world that we're able to try fruits and meats and vegetables and cheeses from all over the world i mean how blessed are we it's it's pretty uh it's all the small stuff in life that <laughs> that we get to have that is just so awesome i had uh some buddies come up um come up from ohio uh my buddy matt my buddy joel who are also steelhead fishermen they're actually uh, my mom flooded my house uh, when she was helping me clean, which I love my mother, but you know, she, uh, she flooded my house and I had to put an insurance claim in because, um, I had to cut the, my kitchen ceiling out. Um, and luckily I have all these amazing friends who, um, did trades with me and everything, uh, to, to take care of fixing up my house. But, um, Matt, uh, Matt and Joel, they're, they're going to come up and do all the tile in my kitchen and in my upstairs bathroom, I've ha I haven't had a vanity um, in my bathroom for like six or seven months now. But uh, but yeah, so they're coming up. And yesterday we went um, to this place called uh, Juicy Burger, which was really, it's really good there. They have fresh cut fries. And it's amazing, uh, you know, you fry a potato in oil and you put a little bit of cracked salt and pepper on them and how good how good a, a french fry is it's just it's a awesome i gotta try to do some some smoked fish here some smoked meat on the grill here pretty soon it's also walleye season so you know it's fish fry time it's tough to beat a walleye fish fry have you guys ever uh have you guys eaten any of those scams that you were talking about or eaten any great lake steelhead Obviously, Duke is lucky. He gets to have... He sent me some smoked fish from Washington that was delicious. Um, the fish in Washington is just such a different thing than anything you'll... Uh, anything you get around here. I mean, it, you, you, when you cut the fish in Washington, your mouth actually, like, waters. It, like, brings out senses that you didn't even know you had when you fillet fish out of the ocean. They're just so delicious. But, um, yeah, the walleye, walleye fish fries are incredible. I haven't found a way that I really love, uh, love the salmon or steelhead out of Lake Erie or Lake Ontario. I was actually telling the guys yesterday, um, it's weird. Like, if you catch, like, 10 steelhead out of the Great Lakes and you fillet them, you'll get a lot of different shades of color and, you know, like you go up to Lake Michigan and you catch a small coho and they fillet like almost bright red. It's like incredible and they taste so good. Like the color definitely goes with the flavor. I know one of those, um, one of those addicted guys, they did a, a, a salmon, like a white flesh salmon versus an orange flesh salmon. And they said that that there wasn't much of a difference or they like the white one more and maybe that's for saltwater fish but over here in the great lakes the redder the fish is the better it is for sure um i never keep wild brown trout but i did see uh on one of the the forums the great lakes forums on facebook i saw one of the guys was talking about um how he went out in uh in the Michigan creeks and he caught some wild brown trout and he showed the fillets and I don't keep wild fish if I could help it because you know they were born in that river you you keep a five pound brown trout out of a river and that fish is probably like seven or eight years old and they've had to really overcome a lot of adversity to uh to get that big in a river um and I don't you know to me I like I said you can have you could have meat imported from Italy so that I can buy. So for me to kill a fish that I love, it's just not worth it to me. Um, but uh, yeah, the the fish that he had, the brown trout, it was so incredibly red. I, I it almost it almost looked like a coho.
right now I'm really paying a lot of attention because I'm trying to line up this checkerboard right now and the grip. Should look pretty cool. They are a lot of work. Like with a checkerboard cork, you actually have to slice each little triangle to line it all up. And then after you cut the little triangles, you have to glue them together like piece by piece and then zip tie it to like clamp it. It's it's absolutely an incredible, tedious task. That is why I am no longer building rods for people anymore. I'm only building prototypes to get factory models made. And I'm, you know, if Duke wanted a rod, I would build him rod because he's bought in like 20 reels within a year and a half. So I would absolutely build him one just because he needs to, if he's got that kind of Colville collection of reels, he needs to have a really cool Colville rod to go with it. And I have so many good customers, I get wrapped into building rods for everybody. The hardest, what was the hardest fishing artifact? What was that, bro? Let me click on this to see if I could, Oscar, what did you say here? What do you think was the hardest fishing artifact you have done? Uh, you got to reword that, brother. I don't know, like, I don't know what that means. Maybe the hardest fighting fish or the the coolest piece of fishing equipment that I've had? I, I'm not too sure what you're asking. But I've had some really cool equipment. I actually, uh, in my basement down here, I have some some really old blanks. Like, I got some llama glasses from the 90s. Um, so I have, uh, one of my favorite rods of all time. It was one of the first float rods I ever owned was a G Loomis IMX. It was a 13 foot two piece, um, from Canada. It was, they're made in the USA and then they were shipped to, um, I think they were shipped to a place where they were, I don't know the actual history, but the gentleman's name who was in charge of Loomis Canada, his name was Lorne Green. And basically he would buy these blanks and he would get them shipped to Canada and he would have them built. And he had the Loomis IMX, um, which was so ahead of its time. And I was super lucky. In 1998, my dad got me a 13-foot Loomis IMX and a... Adcock Stanton float reel. Um, so in 1999, you know, I got that for Christmas and my birthday. My birthday is January 7th, so you kind of get both. Uh, I kind of get my birthday and Christmas present together. So I was able to have a Loomis IMX for my first rod because it was what was suggested to me. And I had an Adcock Stanton. And when I got into center pinning, I honest to God had no idea it would be more effective to fish with a free spooling reel. The fishing was so good in the Great Lakes back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, I would say up until up until 2008, 2009, 2010, that's when it started to decline and that's when there was so many more anglers. So it was uh it made just the fishing the fishing pressure more difficult. Um but uh yeah, I, I got a center pin just because I wanted a different, more challenging way to fish. I had no idea that I was getting into center pinning and it was gonna gonna cause me to catch more fish. And I didn't use any sort of eggs or egg imitations for a long time, or it wasn't a big part of my arsenal. I used to use those Mike Atlas jarred eggs quite a bit. And that's actually what I caught my first steelhead on was a cheese flavored one of those. <laughs> But yeah, it's it's getting it's getting tough. I mean, you know, not only are there more guys, but with the internet now and with all the information out there, you know, guys that spend one year on the river and put a lot of time in can pick up a lot of really good information that like, you know, the stuff that I learned over 20 years, I pretty much share with you guys. Um 
and I try to really help everybody that, you know, it's kind of my job and my livelihood. So people that support me, I really try to help them and make their time better on the water. So I give them information that I know will help them. Um, but it is, uh, it is definitely a different deal. I mean, the fishing was so good back in the early 2000s. I actually started to fly fish because I wanted more of a challenge because it was so easy with the center pin. And, you know, with the center pin, I used to, uh, I used to pretty much primarily just use jigs and I would have the, I would have the Canadian guys come over, um, and they would use eggs and they would, you know, chum the water with salmon eggs and they would follow it with a, with a small egg sack and just kick the shit out of the fish in front of me. Um, and a lot of times it was just, you know, in the fall time or the winter, Come spring, the fish would kind of hone in more on the jigs, and I really ran marabou jigs more than I ran anything. And still to this day, it's my favorite way to fish is marabou jigs. The bite is so incredible, and when they when you hook them, they're really they're pegged. You know, when you're fishing a bead, forty percent of the time you're pretty much gonna they're gonna shake the hook and you're gonna lose them. I mean, forty percent is a good number. Uh, with soft beads, you seem to get a better percentage. You know, I would say. You know, I would say you lose maybe 30% of the fish or maybe, you know, 20%. So I'm hoping with this new mandrel I have, I'm hoping that when I clamp it all up tight that the glue doesn't spread out on the threads and then I can't get it off. So I'm trying to not use much glue. The less glue you use, the... Um, the nicer the seams look. I want to see what you were saying, Oscar. There's got to be a better way than me touching the screen to see what the comments are. Four years, two years, I was doing everything wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's the more you do it, the more confident you get, you know, the more time you spend on the water. I mean, you cannot replace time on the water with anything you're going to read or anything like that um yeah you know duke it's going to be it's going to be good here i'm more worried about you guys man with the doom and gloom of every single year and with uh the closures in washington man i'm i'm like i'm i'm pretty scared of what's going to happen in washington i really hope that uh you know, they figure out a way that the that you're going to be able to fish out of the boats. Um, that's such a stupid rule anyways. I mean, that should they shouldn't have even done that. Uh, I mean, if they need to if they need to put stricter rules in place, fine, but don't risk people's safety. That's just so stupid and people's livelihood. Imagine how many guides, you know, couldn't take out certain clients because they they couldn't fish on boats. It was it was so stupid. I hope that the guides didn't listen and they just they did what they uh, they stood up for their rights and they fished they fished out of the boats anyways. But half the season they closed. They made steelhead endangered and they closed the rivers anyways. So um, you couldn't have even fished out of a boat even if you wanted to. But uh, yeah, next year I'm definitely going to do my best to make a trip up there and visit Duke. I've had a lot of customers. I got a, a new customer named Bart who lives, um, I think he lives on the Puget Sound too, but like on the other side from you. So um, he's got like a, I guess he's got an antique shop and everything and he's got a house right on the right on the sound and he goes um he goes shrimping and fishing and all kinds of stuff he's got a place for me to stay so if i if i head up there duke i will absolutely hit you up and we'll get out and do some fishing bro yeah i mean i it kills me that you know there's any of these wild fish idiots that have an issue with broodstock programs where they're taking the genetics out of the river and spawning those genetics for that river and releasing them in that river. How can you argue with that? You're taking the best genetics from that river and the fish 
They're released small. They still got to go out to the ocean. They're just not born from an egg in the in the river. They're still going to be incredibly, you know, vibrant. Um, the fish that are going to survive, like if they breed a bunch of fish and they release them um, with a broodstock program, the, the ones that aren't supposed to make it won't make it. The ones that have the strong genetics that are meant to come back to the river, they will make it. So I, I'm so sick of hearing the, uh, the argument that stocking fish is a bad thing. I mean, yeah, you don't want to take a fish from a different river system and breed them with, you know, take a fish from a different river system, breed them with another fish from a different river system, and stock them into a, into a river where they've been spawning 10,000 years. That would make no sense because, you know, think about, I mean, I know when I go to Washington and Oregon, the rivers, the fish are different from river to river. And that's why if they like, like look at the Scamania, for example, they picked a strain that is a summer running fish that works out well in certain rivers. If they did that research here in New York and actually picked the correct strain for the correct river, we would have a hell of a lot better fishery, but they don't even care in New York. They spend like zero time researching which fish is gonna do well in which system. I mean, it's, it's a really sad thing and I've lost a lot of confidence in New York. In New York, to me, it pretty much, they seem to stock all the best fish in the rivers that, that, that are in the towns that don't really have anything else going for them. So, for example, they stock really awesome fish or really awesome juveniles in the Salmon River and the Little Salmon River because better fishing means better money for the town and more people will visit. So the rivers by me that, you know, we're in Buffalo, so there's obviously more commerce than just fishing. They don't really pay attention. They put in whatever numbers that they're going to put in, and that's it. And the saddest thing is we're supposed to get a fish ladder here in the Cataraugus Creek, which if they did that, they would open up one of the best spawning rivers in the Great Lakes, and it would create, you know, so many wild fish for this system and for all the other systems. And uh, even the wild fish will absolutely flourish up there because when you have salmon and steelhead that run up there and spawn, they're leaving a lot of eggs in the system. There's a lot of fry for all the wild fish to eat. It's not going to hurt the wild fish. The, the guys... The guys that are against it, they just aren't educated. Go to Michigan and see how it works in Michigan with the wild fish. The the fish the conditions in the river are so good and there's so much food in the rivers. The brown trout, the resident brown trout don't even leave the rivers. Like if they catch a a lake run brown in Michigan, that's like a special occurrence like not in the upper peninsula, but on the west side of Michigan, they have very few lake run browns. Just because the conditions are so good, the browns will live in the river and they'll eat all the little fry, all the little sack fry, and they'll eat um, they'll eat all the eggs. I caught a I caught a brown two years ago that was coughing up fertilized eggs. Uh, fertilized steelhead eggs or coho eggs and when you looked at the eggs the eggs actually had a little embryo like you could see a little fish inside so that's pretty incredible that that brown could like dig up those eggs out of a nest like that because obviously they were buried in gravel if they were that mature and uh, you know they were eating really well um, and if they if they actually like paid attention to that here we would have a heck of a lot better of a fishery, but hey, they're not even worried about putting that fish ladder in because they don't care, which is a sad state of affairs. We could have, like I said, we could have, I mean, we have some world-class fishing by some standards, but it could be even better if they actually put some time and energy and research into it.
but I, I, I can't complain. I got to, you know, hopefully I'll be able to do something about it. My goal is once I get this new shop set up, I want to try to get, you know, some sort of um, pen rearing project on the Cataraugus. Um, and I don't really have the time, so I'm going to need help from a lot of the local anglers, you know, to pitch in pretty much just their time. I'll be able to get people to donate the money we need for the pen project, but I'll need people to go there and feed the fish and help get the pens out at the end of the year and all that good stuff. Which, luckily, I know some pretty awesome people. So right now, I am trying to get these... Trying to get these uh, checkerboard straight, and it is not. It is not an easy thing to do, and there's got to be a better way to do it than hand doing it like I'm doing it. Um, I talked to my friend Jake from Two Track Custom Rods today, and he was, he was saying that you cut the block, the whole block of cork or EVA. Um, on a bandsaw, and then you uh, and then you glue it up. I guess it's a heck of a lot easier of a way than the way I'm doing it. But we will have to uh, we'll have to see. For right now, I'm using the the handsaw and the cork jig, and we'll uh, we'll have to see what happens. But I hope that this mandrel works out like I have planned. Should be pretty cool. This is some new cork. I got like three different kinds of cork here that I'm trying. I'm pretty excited to see how it comes out. I have a cork. It's called Green River, which is right here. I have rubberized cork at the end, and I have uh, wave number three. And then I have some, um, it's called Burnt Green, and it's got like little speckles of green in it. It's really super cool. So I'm excited to see how this turns out. All right, so I got the first one done. I'm not sure how to set these down yet. Probably just prop them up against something. All right, well, I think I'm going to go back to the podcast, guys. Thanks for... Uh, interacting and commenting i really like to hear from everybody duke thank you so much brother love you appreciate all you do man all the support oscar thanks for tuning in um taylor always a pleasure brother thanks for everything hit me up tomorrow when i could take some of that money that you were uh, sending me pictures of um and get you a new reel but uh, i appreciate all you guys love you all hope you have tight lines and i will um Hopefully see you sometime uh, this week or next week. Adios.